When was the last time you prioritized giving thanks to the Lord? When was the last time you genuinely were grateful for the Lord's love? Being ungrateful and unthankful goes hand in hand with being lukewarm. Because if you are on fire for God, then you won't be able to contain yourself. You won't be able to ignore the fact that God has been good to you even though you were undeserving of such love. An ungrateful believer is lukewarm because he or she has lost sight of God's goodness. They have discounted the love, the sacrifice, the passion of Christ. And saints, that's a dangerous place to be in. A state of unthankfulness. A state of ungratefulness. Because imagine if God took his hand off your life. What would you do then? How far do you think you would go? So you see, we ought to be thankful for his consistent love. He's protected us without our knowledge. He's defended us even in our ignorance. That means he most certainly is worthy of all praise. So I encourage you to let your prayer be, Lord, let me never become lukewarm. Let me never become a wishy-washy Christian, but may your fire burn brightly within my heart. Furthermore, it's a dangerous thing to fail to be thankful. Failing to give thanks to the Lord is a sign of an unrepentant heart. There are obvious things we should be thankful for, like your health. The fact that you have a bed to sleep on, food in your stomach, electricity and shelter. These are basic things, things we often take for granted, but just speak to someone who doesn't have shelter. It's only when you see how they are living that you realize how blessed you are. One of the easiest traps to fall into as a believer is becoming too comfortable. It's a dangerous thing to find yourself in a comfortable place where you are neither hot or cold, a place where there is no real fire or spark. It's a dangerous thing to simply get accustomed to God's blessing and begin to take them for granted. Don't ever take the love of God for granted. John 3 verse 16 is a verse that shows just how deep God's love is. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now you need to apply that to yourself. Take this verse and apply it to you. Thank you, Lord, for loving me so much that you gave your one and only son, Jesus Christ, so that I may not perish but have eternal life. Consider just how much physical suffering Jesus endured simply out of love. Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So great was the love of Christ that he was wounded for me and you. He was bruised for me and you out of love. He was chastised and punished all out of love, and the least we could do is have a thankful attitude. When did you last take the time to say, thank you, God, for your goodness? And there are many reasons to thank God for his goodness. You are of sound mind. You have ears that hear and eyes that see. That's the goodness of God. Yes, you might have pain somewhere in your body, but you can still move and walk. This is God's goodness. Good health is a gift from God. Some people have food but their health doesn't allow them to eat freely. Some people have money, but that money can't restore good health. Some people have what you might consider the perfect job, the perfect house, but they don't have peace. So let your prayer be, Lord, help me not to envy others. I pray that envy or greed will not be found in my heart. Our prayer as children of God should be, Lord, give me a heart that's filled with gratitude a heart that will never overlook blessings that you have given me. So count your blessings. God's love is consistent. 
His mercy is consistent. His kindness is consistent. And this is reason enough for you to have a heart of gratitude. So always be thankful and remember, 1 Chronicles 16 verse 34 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His loving kindness endures forever. Before you go to sleep, take the time to say, Thank you, God, for your protection. The fact is, none of us knows what each day holds. You don't know when you walk out the door if you'll walk back in. You don't know what you'll face at any given moment. You can't control a drunk driver's actions while you're on the freeway. You can't control the actions of someone who is mentally unstable on the street. You can't control nature, earthquakes, hurricanes. You have no control over many events that happen. But you have been protected to come back home. You have been protected by the Lord to go all throughout this day without any harm or danger coming to you. That's something to be thankful for. Furthermore, thank God for his protection even when you have faced danger. You might have been in a car accident, but thank God you didn't get hurt. You might have been hurt, but thank God you survived. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9 is a wonderful passage that teaches us that things may be bad, things may be uncomfortable, but there is always a reason to be thankful. The Bible says, We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. We should be believers that rejoice and give thanks to God Almighty through the good and through the bad. Sure, the car broke down. But I thank you for legs that I can walk. Maybe I lost my job. It's a problem. But I can still thank God that I haven't lost my health. Yes, you may not be able to afford the most luxurious dining experience. But thank God that you have never missed a meal. People of God, we ought to have a spirit of thankfulness. Let it be your disposition in life to stop for a moment and say thank you. When Jesus healed the 10 lepers in Luke chapter 17, only one came back to say thank you. Think about that. Only one? If I could get a chance to speak to those nine lepers, I would ask them, how could you take the goodness of the Lord for granted like that? You couldn't say thank you? Unfortunately, many of us today do the exact same thing. We don't take the time to simply thank God for the things that we now deem to be the norm. When the bills are paid, when there's money in the bank, when there's plenty to laugh and be happy about? Do you remember to say, thank you, Lord? I know where you've brought me from. I remember when it wasn't like this. Or how about when you're struggling? Work is tough. The business isn't performing well and you have problems. Do you remember to say, thank you? Thank you, Lord, because I may be hard pressed on every side, but I'm not crushed. I may be perplexed, but I'm not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Find something to be thankful about. One thing we must always remember as children of God is to be thankful. Even in seasons that seem extreme, extreme enough to test the very foundation of our faith, we must remember the importance of being grateful. God loves us and wants us to be a happy and thankful people, full of praise and worship. If you are murmuring and complaining, you leave no room in your spirit to even honor the Lord with your offering of praise and worship. As people of God, we should not be complainers or murmurers. This can lead to all kinds of unknown evil. Complaining in and of itself seems harmless 
and a simple way to let off steam, but it is inherently evil. Not only that, but it always has a snowball effect. It always seems to stem off and break into other deadly sins. Sins like lying, pride, envy, and even lust. These are just a few of the offspring and bad fruits that form when you complain and stop being thankful. So how can a simple act of complaining lead to all these sins, you may ask? Well, a very good lesson can be found in the book of Numbers. We all know about the story of Moses and how he led the children of Israel out of Egypt. But I want to take a closer look at how ungrateful and thankless they became after being delivered from the enemy's camp. Not long after being delivered, the people began to murmur and to complain. The Bible says in Numbers 11, verse 1, Now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. For the Lord heard it, and his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them, and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried to Moses, and when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. But their complaining and murmuring didn't stop there. You see, each day, God provided them food from heaven called manna. It looked like a coriander seed, and it tasted like a pastry cooked with olive oil. God was so good to the children of Israel that they didn't even have to work for their food. The food fell from heaven each day, all they had to do was take a basket and gather it up. However, the Bible goes on to say that they started lusting for meat. They even complained because there weren't any leeks, onions, or garlic. Saints of God, the sin of complaining always meshes comfortably, almost synonymous with other sins. The people went from complaining about the manna to lusting after meat. After all they had seen God do, they simply could not be satisfied. The Bible says that God told Moses to tell the people to consecrate themselves because he heard them. Not only did he hear them, but he was going to give them meat. Not just meat enough for a day or two, or even 10 days, but for an entire month. Numbers 11 verse 20 says, but a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wept before him, saying, Why did we come out of Egypt? People of God, we have to make sure that we remain thankful no matter what it looks like. Nothing was ever good enough for the children of Israel. They complained so much that Moses heard them doing it at the door of their tents. The Bible says that the Lord's anger blazed hotly and that Moses was also displeased. It got so bad that Moses asked the Lord why he burdened him with the task of having to take care of these people. Do you see how evil complaining is? It became a cancer and spread amongst the camp. It spread to Moses, one of the meekest men to walk the face of the earth. And he even started to complain to God about God's chosen people. It vexed him to the point where he asked God to take his life. Now that's pretty bad. The story doesn't end there because the children of Israel complained more and more. In fact, they would not stop complaining. Moses' own family complained to him because he was married to an Ethiopian woman. The people complained about Moses' leadership. They complained about being thirsty. They complained about the promised land and how hard it would be to conquer its inhabitants. They created an idol and worshiped it. They complained that God took them from Egypt only to kill them in the wilderness. They even formed a coup to overthrow Moses. The people just would not stop complaining. The children of Israel angered God to the point where he started taking lives and sending plagues. At one point, God wanted to wipe them out completely, start over, and form a great nation with Moses instead. Hebrews 10 verse 31 says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Another reason complaining is so bad is that it costs you time. Did you know that the journey in the wilderness was only supposed to be an 11 day journey? The people's attitudes and unthankfulness prolonged their journey until it took them 40 long years to get to the promised land. Even then, God still loved them enough that their very clothes and sandals never wore out. Now. I want you to take a moment and think. Think about how many times we as people of God have done this very thing. How many times have we complained to God about 
something we didn't like about our lives? How many times have we complained that we didn't like the way we looked or where we live or the car we drive or we hate our jobs instead of just being thankful? Some of us have been complaining even while praying. Days, months, or years have passed and God's promises still have yet to come to pass. Could it be that some of these blessings have been stifled and put on hold due to our murmuring and grumbling? Being unthankful is an old sin, one that was started long ago with the most ungrateful one of all, Lucifer. Now, Lucifer himself was kicked out of heaven because of his pride. He was God's most beautiful creation, and he was a cherub that guarded the very throne of God. The Bible says in Ezekiel 28, verse 15, You were perfect in all your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. However, I believe that the iniquity of pride worked interchangeably with the sin of complaining. Lucifer probably thought within himself, Why must I have to worship God as beautiful as I am? Why does God have to be worshipped all the time? And why can't I be worshipped? I believe at some point, he complained within himself, and then that pride festered into lust for God's very throne. Not only did Lucifer's complaining and pride get him kicked out of heaven, but it also caused a number of other angels to be cast out as well. It's so easy for a simple complaint to open the door to other sins and become a cancer to yourself and others. God doesn't like when we're unappreciative. It holds back your blessings and your destiny. Men and women of God, Never allow yourselves to be blinded to the point where you can't see how good God is. Never allow yourself to be so encumbered by the stress of this world, your season, or your situation that you take your eyes off God and forget all He has done. I must admit, it's not always easy, but we must remember to remain prayerful and in a state of praise and worship so that the enemy cannot trick us into being ungrateful like he was. Did you know that you actually have to stop being thankful to complain? You have to come out of the spirit of praise and worship, just like Lucifer did, to allow yourself to be consumed with enough negativity to even contemplate murmuring and complaining. You have to allow yourself to drink in that toxicity and allow it to swell up in your spirit to the point where it spews from your mouth. Your mouth and spirit were made to continually flow with blessings and praise to our most powerful creator. This is another reason complaining is so deadly. Anytime we aren't being prayerful, thankful, or worshiping the Lord, we are left wide open for a full-on attack from the enemy. The devil knows this is how he fell, and he wants you to become a victim to it as well. The Bible says in Philippians 2 verse 14, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Lucifer was called the morning star, or the angel of light, and he is jealous of us because we now hold his old position, which he can never get back. We were created to take over his old position and to be thankful beings that love God with all of our hearts, mind, and soul. We are to shine as lights in the world. You cannot do that being a complainer. One of the ways to remain in a state of thankfulness is to take the advice given in Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, Whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So remember to be grateful and thankful, people of God. The Lord has done so much for us that we should always be able to look back and give Him praise instead of taking the time to find something to complain about. It's said that life is a combination of good and bad, hard work and rewards, successes and failures, smiles and tears, defeats and victories. 
All of us go through tough times. All of us go through seasons where it seems as though the odds are stacked against us and pain becomes a feeling we're all too acquainted with. In Psalm 119, verse 71, David said, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. And I've always asked the question, how could it be good for you to be afflicted? How is there any good for you to go through pain, tribulation, and hard times? But here's the thing. Afflictions, tough situations, do more than simply show what kind of character we have. Tough times shape and form our character. Matthew 5, verse 45 says, So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Do you know what this verse means? It means no one is exempt from problems. No one is too saved that they won't ever experience challenges. And equally, no one is too lost that they'll never go through tough times. The sun rises on the just and unjust. The rain falls on the saved and unsaved. Good people have problems. Bad people have problems. And so for us as believers, every time we go through tough situations, it does not mean that we are bad people. It means that we are people. Now, if I could draw your attention to Acts 14, verses 21 and 22, the Bible reads, They preached the good news to the city and made many, many disciples. Then they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch strengthening and establishing the hearts of the disciples, encouraging them to remain firm in the faith, saying, It is through many tribulations and hardships that we must enter the kingdom of God. Now, I believe that affliction, although unpleasant, is necessary for the Christian man or woman. Because if it were not for the struggle you're going through, how would you know that God will never leave you nor forsake you? If it were not for the affliction in your body, how else would you know that by His stripes we are healed? If it were not for the financial challenges you faced, how would you have known that the Lord is a provider? Problems and crises are not eternal. They have a beginning and an end. Psalms 23 verse 4 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Let me tell you a few things about valleys. Valleys represent the tough times of life. And for the Bible to say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the words walk through implies movement beyond. They imply it's for a set time and not forever. This is true when we speak of the tough situations we encounter. They are only for a short while. They are only for a season. We have to go through the valley, but we don't have to live in the valley. And try as you may, you will never be able to avoid your valley experience. It's inevitable. And the thing about our own individual valley experiences is that in no way, shape, or form is your valley, your situation, an accident or a coincidence. Faith is developed through life's valleys. Your character is strengthened and shaped during your time in the valley. Your prayer life, your worship, all of it is refined through the valley experience. You see, the Lord is concerned more about our character than our comfort level. He cares more about our growth as believers than the number of blessings we receive. I would even say that God is more concerned with the state of our hearts than our happiness. I believe that as we go through life and face different trials, should we remain in the Lord? Should we continue trusting in the mighty name of Jesus Christ? Should we stand firm and believe God's promises to be true? Then we will experience what the Bible talks about in James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. As the Bible says, Consider it nothing but joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you fall into various trials. Be assured that the testing of your faith through experience produces endurance leading to spiritual maturity and inner peace. And let endurance have its perfect result and do a thorough work 
so that you may be perfect and completely developed in your faith, lacking in nothing. Afflictions bring about a result in you. It leads to spiritual maturity. It produces endurance. Afflictions will result in you praying with a purpose. Afflictions will leave you with a desire to really connect with God because you know that you cannot go through this battle with your own strength. When the Lord allows you to go through tough times, when He allows you to face certain obstacles, He is refining, molding, and shaping you. In His divine plan, He knows that this situation will build your character. This situation will build your faith. This situation will build your prayer life. So be encouraged. The Lord is sovereign. The Lord is in control. As you go through your valley experience, remember this promise in Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. I encourage you to focus on God and not your problems. As we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is with us. God gives us His presence, and He also promises to lead us and empower us. Maybe you're facing a situation that feels overwhelming. Maybe you feel stuck. You're just barely keeping your head above water. Remember that being without hope goes together with being without God. If you're without God, you're without hope. If you're with God, you have a future. Don't underestimate the power of the Word of God. It's a living Word, a Word that gives you hope. It offers hope for all of life. It offers hope for the sick. It offers hope for broken marriages and relationships. It offers hope for the most challenging problems we face. The certainty of your hope should be based on Christ, meaning that even though everything might not go according to plan, it is still working for my good. That's the foundation we ought to have, never giving up, never losing hope, because Christ will never leave us nor forsake us. My hope is in Christ as the living and the written word of God. The name of Jesus is power. When I hear his name, I imagine all the miracles he performed. I imagine him standing outside of the tomb and speaking out boldly, Lazarus, come forth. And a dead man comes back to life. I imagine Jesus Christ standing in the middle of a storm and speaking with authority, peace be still. And even the storm bows down because there is power in the name of Jesus. I was taught the importance of praying for my home years ago. And praying for my household means that each night I go to sleep, my home is fortified by the blood of Jesus. It's guarded by an army of heavenly angels. It's filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And there is peace that you wouldn't believe overflowing in every corner. So hear me when I say, there is great power that comes when Jesus is the central focus of your home. So take the time out to gather with your family. We gather for everything else. Start gathering together in prayer. Prayer is not an option for us as believers. It's a necessity, a necessity for the husband, for the wife, and for the kids. 